the, a way that the U.S. and Japan could work together, uh, and, and it's global, really. It's U.S., it's Japan, it, it's every other market that, that's seeing, you know, this growth in ESG is to come together and, and set some standards for how companies should be disclosing ESG data, where they should disclose it, and how investors can know that it's reliable and uh, accurate. Minasan yokoso. Welcome to Nichibei Global Talks. I'm Joshua Walker at Japan Society. You know, in our world today, more and more investors are factoring in environmental, social, and corporate governance factors into their decision making. We call this ESG investing for the acronym, and that's the topic of this episode. Joining us from Japan is Dr. Mari Yoshitaka from Mitsubishi UFJ Research and Consulting. She advises investors and stakeholders on ESG investments as their principal sustainability strategist and deputy general manager of their corporate planning department. Our guest from the United States is Billy Nauman, who closely follows and updates the world of ESG trends as a reporter and producer of Moral Money at the Financial Times. Together, we'll discuss and compare ESG investing developments in the United States and Japan. Thank you for joining us today. Let me start with you, Billy. We hear a lot about ESG, but for those of us who are not as familiar with it, can you literally spell out what ESG investing is? Sure. So ESG investing, the, the easiest way to describe it is really to just explain what the letters mean, and it's environmental, social, and governance. And what, what that translates into from an investing standpoint, really at the end of the day, it's a, it's a way of measuring risk. It's a way of risk, risk management. It's a way of analyzing companies on what have traditionally been called non-financial factors. And there's some pushback in the industry now around calling these non-financial measurements because they do kind of, you know, affect the uh, financial performance of companies. But an ESG investor would look at, you know, a company's carbon footprint. They would look at, you know, the potential risk that they face from climate legislation. They would look at the potential risk they would face from other environmental type issues where they may have a problem. And those things might not show up if you were just doing a standard financial analysis, something like waste management, plastic waste, or water pollution, or water usage, all of those things would fall under the E. Under the S, you have social issues. So, you know, think about workers' rights, think about diversity, think about inclusion, think about, you know, equal pay, uh, equal gender pay, equal pay for people of different races, and, and, you know, and then potential problems with, you know, you can always get lawsuits for discrimination or, or stuff like that and sort of the risk inherent there. And the G is the governance. And that's, you know, really the G is, gets the least attention, but honestly, I think it is the most important part. And that's just a way of measuring how well run the company is. So you look at the board, you look at the management, you look at their incentive structures, you look at different ways that the company is running itself and, and kind of the measures it has in place to make sure everything it, what functions well. Marisan, what are the trends in ESG investing in Japan? I understand ESG investing was facilitated by Prime Minister Abe's government's growth strategy starting in 2014 to 15, but are there some of the drivers of ESG investing there? So as you know that the ESG investment became known in 2006 when UN advocated PRI, and at that time the civil institutional investors in Japan signed PRI, but the little known until 2015. The circumstance of ESG investment progress in Japan is quite different from the US. Uh, in terms of the beginning of the ESG investment in Japan, it's back to February 2014, when the government, which is the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy mentioned that the responsibility institutional investors should expand their activities to promote Japanese corporate value and capital efficiency from the medium to long-term point of view. This was a part of the Abenomics growth strategy. In accordance with this policy, the Japan Financial Service Authority, FSA, published a Japan Stewardship Code in 2014 the Japan Strategic Code seeks to promote sustainable growth of Japanese companies through investment and dialogue. So in 2015, the corporate governance code was formulated by FSA and the Tokyo Stock Exchange. It has five basic principles, such as first, ensuring shareholder rights and equality, second, collaboration with stakeholders other than shareholders, 
Third, appropriate information disclosure and ensuring transparency, both fostering responsibility of the board of directors and first dialogue with the shareholders. So both codes were introduced as a part of the Abe's Japan's revitalization strategy to strengthen Japanese competitiveness. Because uh, cross share holdings have been pointed out as the biggest obstacle for Japanese company when trying to enforce governance. In Japan, the GPF is the great engine to promote ESG investments. GPIF, a government pension investment fund, is an institution that manages the pension reserves of the Japan's welfare pension and the national pensions. And their pension money uh, has reached more than 150 trillion yen at the end of the 2018. Um, and making it the largest in the world. So GPF ad- accepted the Japan Stewardship Code and signed to the PRI in 2015. After that, the number of the signatures of PR in Japan has rapidly increased. And as of now, 23 asset owners and 52 asset management companies is signed. Um, the ESG investment balance increased significantly in Japan from 20, uh, 2060 to 2018, the growth rate of the ESG asset in Japan is more than 300% thanks to GPIF. So GPI promotes ESG integration through, uh, throughout all their investment processes. Billy, in the United States, what are the current trends in ESG investments? Has COVID-19 had an impact on these trends? And if so, why? It's, it's similar to, to what Mari san was just saying. You know, ESG has been really, really popular uh, in the investment world here in the U.S., you know we've seen flows, asset flows into ESG products, you know, through the roof. It, it's one of the only areas um, where active investment managers are um, pulling in new money. So when the markets fell, obviously, you know, everything fell uh, at, at once. But what we saw was a lot of ESG funds doing better than their plain vanilla uh, counterparts. So. The, the risk management case for ESG really seemed to show through in that market crash uh, based on COVID. As far as how COVID has affected it, I think everyone was really worried, everyone in the ESG world was really worried when, when it happened, um, that companies and, and investors would stop uh, caring. If you're too busy, you know, just worrying about keeping your head above water, are these ESG goals going to go out the window? Is it, is it a bear market, lug- or excuse me, is it a bull market luxury? Uh, were a lot of questions we were hearing. And I think resoundingly, the answer is no. The ESG is is proven its worth to a lot of investors, and it's only grown more popular. I think what we have seen out of COVID, obviously, I think it's been a wake-up call in a lot of ways. And we've seen really a big rise in investors that are concerned about social issues. You know, here in the States, we, we've seen, you know, so many, so many people uh, suffering from COVID and so many in- inequalities uh, adding to that with our, with our healthcare system and with systemic racial inequality uh, and, and the effects that that has had on the outcomes people have seen from this pandemic. And, and that's really opened the eyes of a lot of investors and, and enhanced the case for trying to improve that through, you know, social investing, the, the S and ESG. On the climate side, I think it's also helped um, highlight, you know, that these issues you know, the, the pandemic is obviously a, a different issue than climate change, but it is, you know, potentially a, a dress rehearsal for what we're going to see with a, with a global crisis, uh, where if we don't start taking it seriously, um, we're in trouble. And I, I think that a lot of investors are, are coming around and, and putting their money in these strategies now more than before. Yeah, Billy, I have a question. I have heard that uh, during this pandemic, actually, they said that Japanese companies highly evaluated by the ESG investors because their high internal reserves keep them well management the COVID-19 to the customers as well as the employees and also the employee management overall. Is it true? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, what, what we saw when, when the market crashed was a lot of companies were in trouble, the ones without large internal reserves. They were, you know, there was stimulus from the Fed. There was, you know, government bailouts, which, which helped keep them alive. But there was a time there for a couple of days where, who knows, they, they were in big trouble. So, yes, companies like, like the ones in Japan with large cash reserves were in a much better position to weather that storm. 
Mariusz, you spoke about GPIF and helped jumpstarting ESG investing. Are there other ways in which the Japanese government has helped facilitate ESG investing? Main promoters of ESG investment in Japanese government are Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry METI and the Minister of Environment MOE. Supporting two codes, um, METI creates a value co-creation guidance, which is a communication tool to connect to, uh, between the companies and the investors. So the guidance provides information that should be conveyed to the investors and the guide to improve the quality of the information disclosure and the dialogue with the investors. METI also produced a series of guidance, such as TCFD guidance, diversity action guidance, corporate governance guidance, and digital transformation promotion guidance, and so on. So, so TCFD, um, as you know, the task force on climate-related financial disclosure is a great driver in Japan for information disclosure. Thanks to the effort by the government, the number of the companies that adopt the TCFD in Japan is the highest in the world. So the as you know, that the, 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 in terms of the environment and the ES investment, climate change is the most biggest issue, the biggest issue for the investors. So Ministry of Environment Koizumi proposed a debut of the export conditions for coal-fired power generation. And afterward, Minister of Economy, Trade, and Industry Kajiyama stated that Japan would not support in the principle as a basic policy for the export of coal-fired power plants overseas. So other than that, the TCF promotion, MOE promotes ESG finance, both direct finance of the equity and debt market, of course, but also indirect finance, indirect finance banking activities, such as local banks for local revitalization. Billy, what does the relationship look like in the United States in terms of federal policy versus market trends on ESG investing? About, about the complete opposite. Uh, you know, everything Mari Sun said about Meti, Meti uh, trying to... Uh, promote TCFD. You know, we, we saw in, in New Zealand that they're, man, they're going to mandate TCFD disclosures in New Zealand. The U.S. is, is on a uh, completely opposite side of things, at least at the federal government level. State governments are, you know, here and there a bit different. California is a bit more progressive on some of this stuff. You, you've seen some good stuff coming out of them. But one of the things that we're starting to see is, is with or without the federal government, things, things are headed in this direction. You know, we see all of the big tech companies, the, the, the biggest companies, you know, in the country, in the world, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, the, the FAN companies, Facebook, Apple, um, Alphabet, Google, uh, Netflix, you know, all setting these targets for net zero emissions, setting, setting these climate goals. And the effect that that's going to have on the market, whether or not the government is going to promote clean energy or promote ESG, they are saying we're not going to buy energy from fossil fuel companies anymore. We're not going to do business with, with data centers that are not using clean energy. And, and the market itself is shifting in that direction. You know, looking at, uh, you know, an example of an ESG investment, uh, Next Era, which they, they do get some, they do get some flack sometimes from the ESG community because they're not a pure clean energy company, but they are the world's largest solar and wind energy provider. And their market cap is now larger than Exxon Mobil. And Exxon, you know, among the big oil companies is, is one of the ones, you know, sort of holding out. You've seen some good commitments out of BP and Shell and some of the European oil majors to, to transition to clean energy. Exxon has not. And I think that, you know, we had a story on that in the FT a couple of days ago, and the stock chart speaks for itself. Uh, <laughs> with the way NextEra has been going up and, and Exxon has been going down, it, it really paints a very clear picture of, of why this is important and why uh, people are interested in it. There, there's a huge opportunity for investors with or without, you know, a stamp of approval from the feds. Marisan, what examples would you point to as successful ESG investing in Japan? As Billy mentioned, that kind of trend in the United States influenced a lot to the Japanese company. Because, uh, for example, the supplier of to the Apple, uh, uh, the Dens, Dens, uh, Nihon Densan, uh, it uh, has a contract with the Apple to pro, uh, provide that their uh, equipment. Uh, uh, produced by the 100% of the renewable energies. And uh, if they cannot produce the goddamn the instrument, uh, equipment, then they may be kicked out from the supply chain of those you know, uh, technology companies. So awareness of ESC investment in Japan has risen rapidly over the last four years, uh, but the non-financial information disclosure by Japanese companies is not enough overall. 
and uh, they do not reach the level that the investors request for their evaluation. So according to the Nikkei and Tokyo, uh, Toyo Keizai's ESG ranking, the ESG high score the companies are uh, like Toyota, Eon, Kirin, Honda, Sonpo Holdings, Marui Omron, and Kao and so on, so on. But the, those uh, top management of the companies actively communicate their sustainable initiatives and promote ESG information disclosure to the stakeholders. For example, Omro uh, holds ESG brief meeting uh, once a year and the CEO talks about the company's mission, purpose, and the sustainability policy uh, with the other top management in human resources, climate change, and corporate governance to ESG investors. The regarding climate related information, uh, because uh, you know, to avoid uh, uh, kicking out from the supply chain or the sold and climate you know, communities, uh, companies in Japan try to disclose the information complying to the TCFD's recommendation in their sustainability report. Some of the companies such as Rico, Ajinomoto, Marui describe the climate related information in their securities report. You know, security report, a securities report called UHO is a document that is stipulated by the Financial Instrument and Exchange Act and is prepared for each business year to be disclosed to the outside. And companies will be punished if the information in the report is false. So described uncertain information is UHO. It's a challenge for the listed company. Uh, but uh, FSA recognizes its importance and encourages the companies its disclosure. Billy, what are some of other challenges facing companies to make greater ESG investments? Are there ways in which the United States and Japan can address some of these challenges together? Absolutely. But before I jump into that, uh, Marisan mentioned uh, Honda, Honda. Uh, and I think there was a really great example out of, out of Honda about, about the way the market's moving. I mean, when they they announced uh, last week that they're going to pull out of Formula One in the next couple of years because they need to dedicate their engineering re resources to electric vehicles. And Formula One, you know, staying dedicated to the internal combustion engine, that tells me that they see that as a dying technology that is not the future of their company. And that move and, and the wording around it, the messaging around it, that this is a move because of where we need to allocate our engineering resources, that's a big deal. And that's a, that's a great example, I think, of, of ways that the market sh is showing the, the direction of travel on this. As far as challenges in the U.S., I mean, I, I think one of the biggest challenges is around getting reliable data. So if you're an ESG investor uh, and you want to make sure that you are putting your money with companies that are doing the right thing, it's really hard to tell <laughs> which ones those are. You know, these are non-financial, as we said, disclosures. So they're not mandated. They're not in an annual report. They're not in a 10K. They're... they're there's something that the company will disclose voluntarily. You may have to ask, you may have to, there are a lot of groups out there that ask companies to fill out surveys. There are a lot of groups out there that try to collect it on their own and try to find ways to model data that they can't receive. But, but the data around ESG metrics is, is very, very messy and very incomplete. And it's bad, it's just, it's just bad. There's the stand, there are a you know, ton of different standards uh, Marty Sons mentioned the TCFD quite a bit, and that's a very, you know, important step in this. But, you know, in terms of what data you're actually tracking, you've got the Sustainable Sustainability Accounting Standards Board called SASB. You've got the Global Reporting Initiative, um, GRI. You've got uh, CDP, which is the formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, you, and the list goes on and on. You've got, you know, companies like MSCI and Sustainalytics that are assigning ESG scores to companies. And, and those are in an inexact science, if I want to be charitable about it. So that's a, that's a big challenge for an ESG investor. And I think that, that the, a way that the U.S. and Japan could work together, uh, and, and it's global, really. It's U.S., it's Japan, it, it's every other market that, that's seeing you know, this growth in ESG is to come together and, and set some standards for how companies should be disclosing ESG data where they should disclose it, and how investors can know that it's reliable and uh, accurate so that they can compare across companies, across countries, uh, and know that they're putting their money where they think they are and achieving what they want to achieve. Marisan, same question to you. What are some of the challenges facing Japanese companies in ESG investing? And where do you see possibilities in US-Japan cooperation? 
Okay, there are so many challenges for us, actually. I, I talk to the 100 companies a year. Actually, I talked to the Honda recently. I'm very glad to know that such a, a, a evaluation of the Honda. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, most companies are wondering how to disclose ESG information to the investors. That uh, Billy mentioned. So particularly setting maturity and the KPIs is very challenging for them. And generally, Japanese companies are not good at the communication to the outside. Um, the top management of Japanese companies treat ESG or e sustainable management as a matter of the course for society, and they are reluctant to publicize it. So, in addition, the disclosure of the quantitative goals tend to be regarded as an inevitable goal for them, and they hesitate to disclose it in consideration of the risks of failure to achieve it. So on the investor side in Japan, they have not well established the methodology for ES evaluation, but I'm so relieved to hear that the brief mentioned that the same situation in the other world. But the, uh, also the human resources and the skills in the asset management, management company in Japan is uh, not enough to extract information uh, from the companies. So therefore, the enhancement of engagement between the companies and investors is very important to expand ESG investment in Japan. So um, Japanese companies must change the mindset for information disclosure from CSR to CSV, creating shared value. Investors should change their attitude, especially in Japan, because of, we have a, such a, you know, after the bubble burst, we have a so low economy uh, more than 30 years. And then the investor ha actually, their attitude is like a unilaterally evaluating companies. They should change everything, uh, the attitude of evaluating them together with the purpose of increasing their value of Japanese company. So in this report actually you must learn from the US. Um, so I think there are some things uh, that Japan and the US can cooperate uh, to address the challenge of this investment. Um, so, I agree that Billy actually mentioned, uh, actually, uh, the, I am asked by Japanese company, uh, which disclosure standard or template be used for the reporting? I belong to ESG information disclosure group in Japan. The study group pays attention to this, you know, SASB, uh, the sustainability accounting reporting set by SASB. So, uh, because this is because it is trying to make it possible to compare the disclosure information of each company by identifying important indications for each of 77 industries. So I think it may be good for Japan to use it as a, one of the models. So I really wanted to run uh, this uh, uh, actually standard. And also that uh, in terms of the ESG debt investment, compared to the US, there's no preferential treatment for the investors, such as a tax exemption of the green local bond investment I believe that such a government support is expected to encourage local government to issue ESG bond in Japan. Um, so finally, as I mentioned, uh, the background of ESG investment progress is different uh, between the Japan and the US. So at the, I read the Billy's uh, article in the Financial Times that uh, you know the US Business Land Table issued a statement that they, uh, it was necessary for them to change from the shareholder first principle to all stakeholders first principle. But on the other hand, Japanese companies have taken great care of the all stakeholders and the society until now. But are not, they are not accustomed to appealing to the stakeholders, uh, shareholders. They uh, don't have any uh, skills to engage with the shareholders. I think Japan and the U.S. can cooperate by taking advantage from such a historical strength to share the knowledge and uh, develop the evaluation methodology of corporate value, as Billy mentioned. I, I think that's a great point. If I can add to that really quick, I, I think that what we saw out, out of the GPIF with the stewardship initiative, um, you know, previously under under Hiro Mizuno when, when he was the chief investment officer there, and, and the way that the GPIF was pushing investment managers, many of which uh, in, in its portfolio were American to vote um, their to vote their shares in line with their ESG values. And, and they made some, some pretty strong statements on that and they followed through with, with how they allocated their money uh, based on how companies were using their power as shareholders 
to, you know, push the ESG agenda. Uh, and I think that was a great example of, of sort of that, that collaboration between uh, Japanese investors, U.S. investment managers, and, um, you know, kind of combining different, different ESG approaches and, and um, collaborating globally. I think that was a, a, a great example. Thank you both. I'd like to ask for any last words from each of you about what you are paying attention to and why you are so excited about ESG investing. Sure. I mean, I think there's a, a long way to go. We're, we're in the very early stages of, of the, the ESG, um, I don't know, revolution. That's not the right, that's not the right word, but, but you know what I mean? I, I think that what is possible to be, you know, what in investors, ESG investors can achieve, we've only started to scratch the surface. The, the amount of money that we need to mobilize to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals is massive. And it, it's pretty clear that governments are not going to put that money up. They're not going to do it on their own. So if we're going to get there, we need private sector participation. And we have, you know, what's, what's called impact investing, which we didn't really talk about, which is investors that are, are intentionally trying to achieve a social outcome in addition to uh, making some money back. They've been a, a big part of that. But I think it's now pivoting to be a much broader set of investors as ESG catches on. And you're going to start to see, hopefully, a lot more money moving into funds and strategies that are promoting the SDGs. We're starting to see it a lot now with biodiversity. I think that's a big topic. Um, touches on many of the sustainable development goals about protecting wildlife, protecting oceans, protecting habitats. Um, a lot of investors are concerned with biodiversity loss and trying to find ways that they can put their money to work to stop that. You're starting to see it with supply chains. Marisan mentioned it uh, a minute ago in terms of companies that are suppliers to the big tech companies and in terms of climate. We're also starting to see it in terms of, of human rights and investors paying more attention to human rights abuses in the supply chains of the companies they're investing in and forcing companies to be responsible for who they contract with and, and how those companies act. And it could be really, really powerful. There, there's a lot of potential here to create some action in, in ways that, that today's you know, world governments are not going to do it, not succeeding. Okay, um, I have just a short comment. So COVID-19 pandemic had changed our body of the body things, the lifestyle, working style, and uh, we learned from the pandemic how the human life is vulnerable. I have been involved in uh, environment and social science more than 20 years now, but uh, just the ESG investment started and uh, still developing in the world. And I learned a lot from Billy today, and thank you very much. And the institutions, uh, corporations have a mission to create a system value together with the stakeholder, all the stakeholders uh, from a long-term perspective. To do so, so no matter how, what happens in the politics, I believe that Japanese and U.S. private companies and financial institutions can cooperate to create new economics for sustainable world. It would be great if both of us could cooperate in overcoming the, all the economic difficulties caused by COVID-19 and creating a new sustainable economic market. Thank you very much. Ikaga deshita We hope you enjoyed this Nichibei Global Talks. From ESG to PRIs to CCFDs, thanks to our guest speakers, these acronyms have become so much more accessible to me in particular, and hopefully others who may not be experts on these issues like our two speakers today. One of my biggest takeaways is how ESG investing has proved its case as a way of risk management against crises like climate change as markets crashed at the onset of COVID-19 and how it's given rise to more investors who care about social issues and inequalities resulting from the pandemic and social unrest around the world. The discussion also helped me identify another area for U.S.-Japan global leadership, that they can work together to set international standards for company disclosures of ESG data and help investors find reliable data about the company's ESG factors. As our speaker has said, the U.S. and Japanese companies can lead the way to build a new economy for a sustainable future. Thank you for joining. Please subscribe to our channels and follow us on social media to stay connected. Thank you again and see you soon. Mata oai shimashou!